This, this is the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Find us on air, online, on mobile, and on your smart speaker. Please subscribe at ourautoexpert.com. Our Auto Expert. 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 Now, here's the host of Our Auto Expert. Our Auto Expert. Nick Miles. Locally created, nationally celebrated, from the southeast to the northwest, this is the World's Car Radio Show. If it has a throttle, we'll feature it on air, online, on smartphone, or on smart speaker. This is our auto expert, where two million Americans get their automotive news daily. I'm your host, Nick Miles, along with truck girl Jen. We drove in today in the brand new Chevy Tahoe, Mm -hmm. which Jen called dangerous when she got out of it. I did. You nearly slipped and fell. I did. It was a big <laughs> step down for you getting out of the car, wasn't it, Jen? It wasn't that big of a step. It was down. about half your body size. It, yeah. Okay. No, I just slipped on the side skirt. It was a bit wet, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a little you scary. Puddle up to your knees. <laughs> it's, tra- it's almost it's but dangerous it's a- for you coming in and out of the studio, isn't it? Apparently, but it is such a beautiful vehicle. All right. How much money did you lose in Vegas when you took the week off last week? Actually, we actually won. Do I have to increase your pay just to make sure that you can survive? <laughs> you no won. Comment. Yeah, you we won. won. We won the last day. Yeah, I was kind of cool. Not a lot, but like I said, we didn't gamble that much. Interestingly enough, you were telling me on the way in you won thanks to Sean Connery. Yes, yes, right. we won on 007 Thunderbolt. That's lovely, Miss Money Benny. I know, right? It's oh, mm. really good. <laughs> Pack show today. You'll be uh, excited to know if you didn't already. I d- we have a lot of stuff. You did know already? <laughs> yes. How did you know that? I don't know, Nick. Is it because you put the show together for Maybe, me? Maybe, yeah. yeah. All right. That's, uh, that's good to know. Uh, what have we got on the show today? Pack show. Uh, we're going to talk about the brand new Toyota CHR Midnight Edition. Uh, they have a darkened, sexy, spirited CHR mm. version. Uh, we're going to get into the relaunch of the automotive industry. New facts and figures starting to show up now about how people are getting out and repurchasing cars or purchasing cars for the first time. New models being introduced. I spent the last couple of weeks traveling to uh, to see new introductions of vehicles. Um, I got to drive a few of those over the last week or so. Can't talk much about those because they're embargoed. Can tell you what I did drive. Drove Even the, the vroom vroom one. Yeah, I mean there uh, were a lot of vroom vroom ones. I drove well, the new Chrysler Pacifica, that's uh, the, one the I'm new Pinnacle. About. That was awesome. Talking I was, about the other. Oh, you mean the Hellcat? Yes. The new Hellcat Durango with 710 mm. horsepower. The new uh, Red Eye Charger with uh, 797 horsepower. The new Veloster Elantra. Uh, the new Veloster. The new Vela- uh, Elantra Hyundai Elantra. <laughs> You're so excited you can't even talk. <laughs> I know, right? Hyundai Elantra and the uh, Hyundai Elantra N Line. The uh, Sonata N and the Sonata N Line. <clears throat> I got to uh, sit in the Tucson. I actually got to drive the Tucson. Really. Yeah, I wasn't supposed to. I just moved it from parking space to parking space. Don't you love that? Not supposed it to drive counts, it. Still counts. It did. It was. A, it was. It's actually a very dynamic design. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how any of these drove because they're all under embargo right. for another few weeks. Uh, we're going to talk to Sean <laughs> Sean Mirabal about the brand new Nissan Rogue. Here's the thing, uh, and we'll talk more about this when the segment comes up. But when you go to a dealer to buy a brand new Nissan. Nissan have a competitor at the dealer because they want to show you that their vehicle is better. We'll tell you what that competitor is, and uh, we'll talk to Sean about why they decided to do that. How are vehicle sales doing? Mike, Mike Cordell is joining us. He's the other half of our auto expert to talk about that. And so in another segment is Tyson Hominy. He is the vice president of data and analytics at J.D. Power & Associates. There are two new editions of Minis about to hit the streets. We'll find out about those. Anton Warman is going to explain to us what's going on in the automotive world as far as business, autonomy, and electric vehicles are concerned. And Perry Stern from MSN Autos is going to join us to tell us about winter driving and how a lot of people slip up what they don't know, what they should know, and how to keep your backside from getting in trouble. I'm sure we could all take into account as well. Is that a good idea? It's perfect. Do you ever get into trouble when you winter drive, Jen? Mm, no. No, because you're pretty much perfect, aren't you, in every no. aspect of your life? No. <laughs> no, I'm the one who always forgets, oh, is it too high, too low for, you know, to get that four-wheel drive? Because oh. you don't use it, you know? So I always call my dad, and we have our own little 
The Think one message I have for everybody about four-wheel drive, everybody, four-wheel drive will help you start, but it doesn't right. help you stop. Correct. And I learned that at the driving school, so yes. you should definitely take that. Yes. Everybody thinks four-wheel drive helps you stop. No, it doesn't. No. It'll help you start, but it won't help It'll you stop. It'll help you go slow. <laughs> But it doesn't, it. yeah, it doesn't help you uh, to to break or anything like yeah. that. All right, so I want to delve into uh, this brand new CHR, which uh, Toyota have on the blocks here that you can go uh, test drive, and of course you can go purchase as well, which I'm sure Toyota would be happy. You know, when Toyota designed the the blend of a sports coupe and a hatchback, which uh, they came up with this compact crossover, it's sort of a bold, expressive design and drive. It's their unique CHR. HR that happened it's a standout design for 2021 it's sort of an edgy vehicle it was the new introduction of the nightshade edition that really also brought more attention to this new crossover it's sort of the uh, standard in coolness in the crossover it's segment just so different it is it is different it is sexy it also comes with that Toyota Safety Sense 2.5 we're going to find out about that and that's across all of their trims and it sort of also broke new new ground for the automaker in their whole design features as well. And so why not find out more about that? Joining us now is Rommel Mumin. Uh, he is the manager from Toyota's marketing department and he's in charge of the CHR. So Rommel, let's uh, let's find out first of all that, you know, Toyota's always been the sensible brand. It's the brand that does everything right. This is a little bit uh, outside of the circle for Toyota, you got a little bit edgy there with the CHR. Um, this is something new, but it seems to look absolutely outstanding. Uh, a new experimentation in being a bit ostentatious, maybe? Hello, Nick. Uh, thank you, first, for having me on the show. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yes, we are so excited about CHR. Uh, you, you hit a lot of the high points at the very beginning in your introduction, uh, but uh, one of the key things that uh, the chief designer wanted to do on this vehicle was to make it stand out. And it definitely does amongst the, the crowded segment that it, it plays in. Um, you'll see a very distinctive shape if you look at it from above, this diamond shape, uh, where the wheels are really at the far corners of the vehicle, which really was one of the priorities of the chief engineers brought from a handling perspective. And um, all of those things thrown together really make this car stand out in a, in a sea of you know, uh, entry-level crossovers. Uh, and that's one of the key style, uh, elements that makes uh, CHR so successful in the market. Styling is a huge factor in, in its purchase reason. I've said this for a long time, Rommel, and one of the things that I get bored with is there are so many vehicles in this segment that look like dead fish. I mean, they're just so boring. <laughs> they are. And, and you really thank goodness that someone was willing to break the mold and do something a little more exciting. I mean, even down to things like the back door handles, you just didn't put a chrome door handle uh, on the back in the normal place. You even, you even sort of hid the door handle uh, halfway up the door. That's absolutely right. Actually, CHR means uh, coupe high rider. Um, so as you introduced it, you said between a, a car and a crossover, and that rear handle is tucked in to the top, and you can't even see it. So it, it profile, the profile of the vehicle is that much more swoopy, and it looks like a two-door coupe, but it's got these uh, really neat door handles up up on the top, and they're, they're, they're blended in. Um, and a lot of the styling, you can see, has these bulges that really make you feel like you're driving a really sporty car. Um, so it, it, it's, it's very distinctive. The headlights, you know, they pull right back into the, the hood of the vehicle. If you look at the daytime running lights on the limited model, they extend all the way really deep into the hood. And it's very distinctive <clears throat> from any angle. Um, so, yes, we're super excited. If you look towards the very back, there's a really big rear spoiler that helps smooth the air through. Um, so the, ver the car is extremely distinctive, and it's what really makes uh, CHR stand out. A lot of times I go to these car shows where uh, often people in their late teens and early 20s take some classic cars, perhaps that are 10, 15 years old, and they put body kits on it, which those body kits could involve sort of extending the uh, wheel wells. They can be extending, uh, you know, portions of the body to give it sort of a more muscular look and an angulated look. It's sort of already there with this vehicle. There's angulated portions of the vehicle. You, you've sort of almost done an aftermarket look on a vehicle as it came out of the factory. 
Uh, as, as I mentioned, I think Nick, uh, I think you, you, you're right. Um, as I mentioned, the, the chief engineer's design uh, philosophy behind this car was to make it a really great handling car, and so just key styling elements were built in, as you would see potentially on a sports car. But you can also enhance this vehicle. The, there are, you know, Toyota Racing de- Development TRD air filter, lowering springs, oil filter. Uh, so you can you can tweak it just a little bit here and there, and, and for, for, for the practical person who's willing to taking it out and you know and and put you know, you know skis or, or or a kayak or something on it right. you can get removable crossbars and so the, the car is very practical in the uh, in the last minute or so that we have left let's talk about the midnight edition so you blacked out a lot of things on this vehicle yes uh, it's, it's a nightshade uh it's the uh chr nightshade edition it's available um in four different colors which um it's uh, white uh, this gray, uh, supersonic red, which is a uh, super exciting color. We love that. And, of course, black. Uh, it comes with black wheels uh, and some black accents, the door handles. Um, and, and on the inside, there's certain, certain elements that are uh, specific to nightshade. And you've also given it uh, 2.5 as far as Toyota Safety Sense. I thought two, uh, Toyota Safety Sense 2.0 is pretty good, but 2.5, it gives some enhancements? Yes. So this is this is uh, one of the biggest additions for 2021. All, the vehicle already had a lot of standard safety features, as you mentioned, for 2020 and before. And for 2021, uh, Toyota Safety Sense 2.5 is standard from the entry level LE model that starts at 21.4, 21.5, uh, and and the Safety Sense comes uh, Safety Sense 2.5 comes with some really amazing features such as pre-collision system with pedestrian detection, right. uh, lane departure alert with steering assist, um, automatic so high beams, and a lot. Yeah. yeah, an absolute lot. I say go test drive it. It looks amazing. It sounds amazing. We will have to get it on the road soon. Thank you, Rommel. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Catch up with previous episodes of the show at our website, ourautoexpert.com. You can hear all past show, see our automotive videos, and read inside the car stories about your next ride. Our Auto Expert is where 2 million Americans get their automotive news daily. You'll find it all at ourautoexpert.com. As the car industry reopens and people start to sell more and more vehicles, although they have been selling a lot online. Our auto experts, Mike Cordell, joins us to talk about that. So, Mike, how many new vehicles have you bought in the last week or so? Oh, I've got myself <laughs> one. I've done it. I bought one new product this week. It's two wheels. Oh, that was right. You bought a, a bike for your son, right? I, I did. I bought my son a Honda CRF uh, 125, and it's called the Big Wheel. So it's the, the smaller motor, but it, it it's a little bit larger in stature because my kid's 13, and just learning to ride a dirt bike so it fits his body. But, uh, yeah, exciting, you guys. Exciting week right now in the auto industry. I know, Nick, uh, holy smokes, you were in L.A., then you were in, in Charlotte, so you were out test driving for Hyundai, and then you were in Charlotte test driving for, uh, you know, for the, the team at FCA, so you were out there driving some new Dodges. And, you know, myself, I'm headed headed to uh, L.A. this weekend, and then I'll be up in Detroit for the Mach-E and the F-150. So the auto industry is opening back up, and it's great. They are. It's very different, though. Um, you know, all precautions off. Everybody's, uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, eating in their rooms a lot of the times, and uh, you're in your own vehicle. You have no contact with, with, uh, with people. Um, you know, you don't, you're not riding with partners. It's not like the old days where there was big dinners and a lot of those sort of things. It's uh, You get met by one person at the airport, and then you go in your own shuttle, and you, you do all those sort of things. It's, it's a very different world, though we're getting back out there to do stuff. Um, I can go through whole events with hardly seeing anybody. All of the uh, presentations are on your own in your room, and uh, you really it's almost like being isolated, but I'm still getting out there and test driving products, which is really great. And that's great because we're getting to let consumers know, you know, the latest and greatest in news. And, uh, you know, it was really weird yesterday, um, you know, Elon uh, went and was tested four times with Tesla. So it was a very interesting story. I don't know if you saw that on CNBC or not, but Elon was tested and, and he did four tests in one day. And during those tests, he was uh, 50 percent negative and 50 percent 
positive. So it was it was really weird. Four tests, two were positive, two were negative. That's uh, that's super interesting. I think in the, it, we're still learning so much about this disease, but life has to still go on. People has to have to still have their lives. Uh, interestingly enough, some of the predictions that I've started to see coming out, and still some of these surveys, early data is now showing that a lot of people are now expected to repurchase vehicles, and public transport is expected to take a huge dip. Um, uh, cars are becoming more popular as people are saying, you know, we're going to turn to taking our own vehicles everywhere and not use Uber, Lyft and public transport. And so the auto industry could have a huge turn in 2021. I think that's it's totally true, Nick. And I think there's there's a resurgence in the auto industry. And I think part of what's making the industry successful, not only with used cars, but new cars, are the incentives that automakers started offering back in March, April, and May, deferment of payment, and, and they're still offering some of these things. So it's making it uh, an advantageous time for people to go buy cars. So if you want to buy a car through Ford, you know, there's options. And uh, companies like General Motors, they'll even deliver the car to your house site unseen. So if you know the exact make, model, and, and year of vehicle you want, uh, you know, they're, they're doing a better job at vetting and allowing you to take receipt of that vehicle at the house. So if if Truck Girl Jen wants, uh, you know, a brand new F-150, Truck Girl Jen can get a brand new F-150 hmm. delivered to her house. Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm. oh. You know, I wonder if you could get tests. So there's 42 brands. You get a three-day test drive. That's three times 42. You could have 180 days of test drives. Just saying. Well, Isn't that awesome? <laughs> it is. It is. It's the way to do it. Now. Well, you know, that, that would be a great way to launch a career, you know? Uh, what an automotive test driving <laughs> career <laughs> well you have to go through you know the industry i could just do that i th- i'm just saying i think that probably after a while the dealerships might cotton on you to you catch on? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I, Darn. i'm just i'm just saying yeah at some point in time um i think you know for a lot of time we we realize that this isn't going to go away soon and i think consumers are the same thing they, they realize this isn't going to go away soon and you just have to find ways to function with it i think putting restrictions on everybody is not going to necessarily help you just have to learn how to function at a level where everybody is safe or comfortable or both and you have to function around it i think that's the easy yeah thing. no doubt People are learning how to do that, be right. safe and function no doubt, around no it. Doubt. And at everybody's yeah, own level, think, right? And I think that's that's part of it, you know. And, and for me, and, and I know you and, and Jen, Nick, we're excited to be out talking about cars again. If we can do it in a safe way, you know, we'll do it. We have to fly. I'll be going to Los Angeles this week. And then Friday evening, I'll fly up to Detroit where I'll be, you know, getting a chance to drive the new Mach-E. And, you know, when you add it all up, it's a great opportunity to at least share with consumers what their new options are going to be for vehicles here, you know, into 2021, because this isn't going anywhere. No, absolutely. Um, I, I also like the fact that um, we'll find out, I think, later today from J.D. Parent Associates, we have uh, Tyson uh, Jomini on today, who's going to tell us a little bit about how the industry looks. Although people are changing their habits and changing how they shop, they are still shopping, which is uh, which is good. I think some of the figures are getting better and better um, as far as car sales are concerned. But also, uh, we're also noticing, Mike, some of the better deals uh, still around this year, and especially those sort of segments that aren't selling well are probably going to have some huge discounts towards the end of the year. Yeah, and that's what's really great about the industry. You know, when you get into October, November, December, automakers are forced to switch over inventory on dealership lots from the 2020 model to the 2021 model. So if you are looking to get in a new car, right now is such a great time because 2020 models, if they still exist and are available on a dealership lot, they're going to provide you with a great incentive to get into that vehicle, whether it's three, four, five grand uh, of incentive towards that vehicle, uh, they're going to find a way to move you into that over a 2021. You're going to get a great opportunity on a vehicle and get a little bit of a discount and deferment of payment. So imagine that, right? Great price on a vehicle, deferment of payment up to six months, depending on the brand, uh, and incentives to make it more advantageous to buy a vehicle with financing. And if you think about interest rates right now. You think about financing rates right now. You think about loans right now. It's a great time to get in a car. And, uh, you know, I might be doing it right now. I might just go buy one right now. Uh, What will you buy? Here in 20 minutes. (laughs) What will you buy? Ferrari. Oh, oh. Uh does your wife know? (laughs) You can't hide that very well. Uh, Mike Cordell (laughs) from Our Auto Expert. You can watch some. He has some really good videos. You want to watch some of his truck videos, they're at OurAutoExpert.com. 
Um, Mike and I will also be doing live TV uh, next week. You want to watch that? Uh, all those will be posted at Our Auto Expert. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert podcast. This is Our Auto Expert radio show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can start a conversation with us, just direct messages at Our Auto Expert. It's where 2 million Americans get their automotive news daily. A brand new Nissan Rogue is hitting the market with a starting price of $25,650. But that's not even the beginning of the story. This vehicle, I have to say, is pretty mouth-dropping, even just to walk around it, to get in it. It's not the Rogue that you may think that you know. This is definitely making a statement in the Rogue department that has not been there before. Now, there is a news story that uh, hit newsstands recently that uh, different Nissan dealers actually have a competitive vehicle in their their lots on their lots and they want you to drive the competitive vehicle to actually uh, put it up against the Nissan Rogue that Nissan are so confident that the Rogue is absolutely outstanding they want you to drive both the Nissan Rogue up against the new RAV4 at some of the dealerships to prove absolutely how outstanding the Rogue is so Knowing that Nissan is so confident in this brand new Rogue, uh, we wanted to have a guy on who can tell us all about it. Regional Vice President of the Western Region, Sean Mirabal, is joining us to talk about the new Rogue. So that story aside, Sean, you are obviously pretty uh, empowered by the brand new 2021 Nissan Rogue. Yeah, good morning, Nick, and uh, great to uh, to be talking to you again. It's been a little bit of uh, time since we've uh, chatted. Yeah. Uh, but we are super excited about this all-new Rogue. It is a home run, and you are uh, 100% correct. Uh, we are so confident in this new product uh, that we're encouraging customers to come into their local dealership and uh, test drive the all-new Rogue alongside with the uh, Toyota RAV4 uh, so that they can ex- Experience firsthand how great this new model is. What What's the key? Why do you think this Rogue is better than the RAV4? There's a number of items, uh, Nick, that uh, that make it better. Uh, we are staying with uh, with our priorities, which is safety, right? That's our number one priority. It's got the most standard safety tech in its class, standard safety shield uh, 360. Uh, beyond that, the modern look and sophisticated interior uh, is a home run. Uh, you have to get in the vehicle uh, to experience it. I can't do it justice over phone, uh, but the new signature elements like the, the floating roof line, the double V motion grill, the LED lamps, the NASA-inspired zero-gravity seats, the premium quilted uh, leather, the stitched instrument panel, I could go on and on uh, in terms of the interior, but it, it is a home run. It's also a family hub for us. There's a bunch of new comfort and convenience features. Uh, the rear doors open nearly 90 degrees. It's got tri-zone air control. So now on those uh, so- hot summer days, uh, when your kids come into the car, they have the option to uh, to blast the AC in the back row. Uh, and there's also some new smart storage, uh, new smart storage available in this in this vehicle. Uh, to top it off, convenient, intuitive technology, standard Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, and available wireless Apple CarPlay. Uh, as well as available ProPilot Assist and ProPilot Assist with Navi Link. Uh, and last but not least, the, the most important part, obviously, are the premium driving dynamics. Uh, and that's why we're encouraging customers to come into local dealerships to actually drive this vehicle alongside the competition. Uh, the new powertrain is great. The NVH is, is leaps and bounds ahead of the old Rogue. Uh, and the only way to really, really understand that is to experience it and drive the car on the test drive. I am pretty astounded by uh, many things with this vehicle. I mean, it does. Seeing it in person is the only way to really do it because I didn't think I could be in love with a vehicle in this class as much as I am with a Rogue. And it is surprising how, how much it uh, really is so much better in person. Photographs do not do it justice. But there are eight different trim levels if you count front-wheel drive and all-wheel drive uh, in this vehicle. And, and the other surprising thing is there is 
so much uh, difference between uh, trim levels. You know, you can start at twenty five thousand dollars six hundred and fifty dollars, twenty five thousand dollars six hundred and fifty, and go all the way up to thirty six thousand eight hundred and thirty. I mean, there's a big that that's over ten thousand dollars in breadth for somebody, and so there's pretty much everything for for everybody, right? Absolutely, Nick. And and new to this uh, model year for the all new Rogue is that platinum trim, which is that ultra ultra high-end trim uh, that we have for the Rogue. And we've, we've listened to customers and consumers. Uh, and a lot of those features that are now available on the Platinum trim, typically you would have to go into a near-luxury vehicle or a vehicle with a, uh, a third road. So we've listened to our customers, we've listened to the market, uh, and we've brought this all-new Platinum trim to the Rogue uh, with premium features uh, for customers that do want a family vehicle but only two rows. Did you do you feel like Sean that you're slightly breaking the edges off the difference between um, let's say a luxury vehicle and the top trim levels with the platinum? Are you sort of edging into infinity territory here? I think so. We're pushing the boundaries, right? So uh, our job as a manufacturer is to understand the market, uh, try to understand where consumers are willing to go, try to figure out what their objections are. Uh, to a mass market vehicle versus near luxury uh, and figure out if, if we can't get them to uh, to step into our product. Uh, and that's exactly what we're doing with the all new Rogue. Now, I noticed that uh, the storage in the back, you have this new storage area that fits sort of a, a gallon of milk in the back. And, and that's one of my pet peeves always. You know, you buy a two liter soda bottle. You had a choice of putting it in a net at the back, but they're, or maybe where the spare tire goes, uh, if you didn't want them to be rolling around the back the whole time that you uh, you left the supermarket. But you've actually sort of created a space to hold items that could roll around the back of the vehicle, right? Yeah, Nick, and, and there's an interesting story behind that, and it's driven by one of our designers. Uh, at the early onset uh, of designing this vehicle, she had the very same similar concerns that you did. Uh, and she said, every time I go to the grocery store, uh, I get a gallon of milk and it rolls all over the place. And uh, why haven't any manufacturers created something to uh, to accommodate uh, the shopping needs uh, of a family? And so she was uh, a driving force in developing uh, that concept, and uh, we were able to bring it to life. And we've received a lot of positive feedback from consumers as a uh, you know a excellent feature and a surprise or aha with this vehicle. Have you also, are you also aware, Sean, that it absolutely is the perfect size for a 1.5 liter bottle of Bacardi rum as well? Mm. I have not put a 1.5 <laughs> liter Bacardi rum back there, but uh, I have carried alcohol from the, uh, from the store back home. Sounds like a uh, challenge. <laughs> Yeah, I just, you know, I was wondering if maybe, you know, she'd been to a party and also seen that that, that, that was the perfect size there at the back, too, as well. Uh, I think that I was... won't tell you where her inspiration comes from, <laughs> but I'm, I'm sure there's more to the story than uh, we're telling. I know that safety is a huge deal um, for, for Nissan. Uh, if, if I remember rightly, and, I, and I'd have to go back in my notes and just double check, but about 70% of modern uh, active and passive safety features that are on vehicles today as standard and optional safety features actually came out of the Nissan group. So that's a big deal for you, isn't it? Yeah, it is. We're like, like I started this segment, uh, that, that is a passion point for Nissan. That is part of our, our core DNA, uh, and it's our number one priority. And uh, we have high beam assist, lane departure warning, rear cross traffic alert, rear automatic braking, blind spot warning, and automatic emergency braking with pedestrian uh, detection. All standard equipment on this uh, this all new Rogue. So we stay committed to that vision, uh, and we're going to stay committed to that vision as we continue with our Nissan Next plan of uh, redesigning uh, ten vehicles in the next twenty months. That will be a core part safety will be a core part of that strategy. 
Now, one of the other things I also uh, n- noticed with you is it, it and moving slightly away from the Rogue is it, it, the Rogue's not the only vehicle that you do this with. Is make a lot of these standard safety features uh, on the Rogue. You know, you make them on even down to the kicks. It gets a lot of standard features that that come on these vehicles. It's sort of a core of all of your brands. That even if you get the the lowest trim level, you still get quite a lot that comes with those trim levels, right? That's correct. It's part of our DNA. It's part of our core strategy, uh, and I expect it to continue forward with every uh, minor model change or full model change that we make. Uh, it's something, once again, going back to customers and consumers and asking them what is the most important thing uh, in, in your purchase decision. Uh, safety typically pops at the very high end, and so uh, we've made a strategic decision to continue pushing Uh, safety into all of our vehicles we think it's the right thing to do and consumers also want it and finally you've kicked up the uh the engines uh, the engine horsepower a little bit as well yeah we uh we're at 181 horsepower with 181 uh, foot pounds of torque uh, a better drive there was a lot of performance dynamics uh decisions and changes made with the all-new road which which makes for a better ride a better drive for families uh, you know, and we've also come up with some uh, pretty intuitive features, such as the rear sunshades that help for, for long drives. Uh, so a lot of thought went into uh, this all-new Rogue and the features that uh, that are now available. Sean, it's always great to have you on the show. Um, I would encourage somebody, you know, if you're thinking about buying a brand new crossover, you can get two uh, test drives in one. Just go to your Nissan dealer and you can go test drive the brand new Rogue and you can test drive the RAV4 at the same time. Uh, they'd be happy to uh, put you into both of them, starting as a, with an MSRP of $25,650. The 2021 Rogue is uh, hitting dealerships uh, as we speak uh, or, and it's on sale. Uh, I think it's on sale about now, isn't it? It is. You can head down to uh, to your local dealer now and uh, put a deposit on one if it's not currently available. Uh, but most dealers have one or two in stock with a uh, a, bunch, a bunch more in the pipeline soon to be delivered. Sean, hopefully when this pandemic is over, we can hang out and have a drink together. Sean Marable is from Nissan, the West Coast region big chief. We'll talk to you soon. Stand by. More Our Auto Expert on the way. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Your smart speaker can be your radio. Just say, hey, Google, hey, Alexa, or hey, Siri, play our audio expert radio show. And all previous episodes of the podcast are available. Hours of endless fun awaiting. I'm Nick Miles, and this is our auto expert radio show, where two million Americans get their automotive news daily. Well, the Chevy Suburban is uh, back. The Tahoe and Suburban are back. Uh, Chevrolet's iconic people and cargo hauler begins a new chapter and introduces the all-new 2021 Chevrolet Tahoe and Chevrolet Suburban. Each has its redesign, and it's the ultimate SUV, offering the most interior space of any SUV, exclusive technologies and features, and the best driving dynamics in a full-size segment. SUV. There are no vehicles like the Tahoe and Suburban. They have uh, the Hollywood movies, the stars all super excited about them. They carry military heroes and world leaders. They help create countless family memories uh, all over the world. Uh, presidents, vice presidents, um, they ride in them. Uh, they've taken people you love, uh, pioneering expeditions in SUVs. Uh, they've made countless movies and they've shipped cargo for uh, Great films and expeditions, uh, we've probably named thousands of, thousands of them, uh, even achieved uh, some great transitions uh, over time. Uh, well, some of the strongest aspects of these full-size SUV, the SUVs have been tailored by some great engineering results, a class-leading interior space. 60% more cargo room behind the third row uh, for the Tahoe and 19% more maximum cargo space behind the first two rows for the Suburban. 
which of course is best in class. 10 additional inches, 254 millimetres of third row legroom for the Tahoe. A dramatically improved driving dynamics for these vehicles. The most advanced suspension in the segment with an independent rear suspension paired with available magnetic ride control, which is the first in class air ride adaptive suspension. And new air ride adaptive suspension offers load leveling at all four corners of the vehicle and up to four inches, which is 102 millimeters, of ride height adjustment. That's right, if you go over somewhere that's tilty, it can adjust the ride height. Which wish my legs could do that for me on I occasions. Know, right? <laughs> uh, the, uh, the SUV's interior offers up to five display screens in total, a standard 10 inch, which is 254 millimeters, diagonal center color screen, and that's a touch screen, by the way. Uh, is the largest in segment. Available 8-inch, 203mm diagonal instrument cluster. Available 15-inch, 381mm heads-up display with uh, no competitor offering that size of uh, screen. Available dual 12.6-inch, 320, I think, millimeters of diagonal rear screen, the LCD monitors, uh, part of the segment's advanced screen media entertainment. Now, they have 30 safety and driver convenience features, highlighted by a standard automatic emergency braking system and new features, including an HD surround vision and rear pedestrian alert system. Now, the technology, uh, the optimized technology and efficiencies include a new 3-liter Duramax turbo diesel turbo diesel engine, Jen hates those, delivering up to an unprecedented combination of refinements and performance and efficiency. A new V8 engine, Jen loves those, dynamic fuel management, including a 6.2 liter V8 offering best in class, 420 horsepower, Jen loves that. 10 speed automatic transmission for all engines with a push button electronic shifter. Mm, there, mm, I, I like the column shifters better, but that's because I'm old school. Best in class, nine camera views and new trailering feature designed to help improve the driver experience confidence. Jen never uses it because her boat's been in the garage for <laughs> five years. Uh, including a trailering profile, trailering tire pressure and temperature monitor and side blind zone alert for trailing. She's never taken her boat out for five years. With an increased number of SUVs on the market, with all new Tahoe and Suburban, it needs to reach even higher um, standards of towing, which Jen will never use if she buys one because she hasn't <laughs> taken a boat out for five years, uh, which really has transformed the Suburban and Tahoe for really great new technologies for delivering family experience and, of course, towing, which Jen will never use because her boat's been in the garage for five years. The 2021 Tahoe and Suburban go on sale right or are on sale right now in North America, um, along with the Silverado, the Silverado HD, and of course the completely de- redesigned Chevrolet full-size truck lineup. Um, and they're all at your Chevrolet dealer 6. now. 2. You can do anything you want, including tow, which Jen will never do because they're both in the garage for five years. I actually there you go. towed something. What? Yeah, I towed out a Ford truck. <laughs> oh. But not your boat because it's been the garage. That's for five right. Years. Yeah, no, yeah. Is there your guess. boat? Your boat's probably welded to the floor of the garage now. Probably wouldn't be able to tow it out, would you? Oh, it's at your dad's garage, though, isn't it? Uh huh. Yeah. It's all <sighs> smuggled in, tucked away. Hey, guess what I got this week? What? My new BMW arrived. Oh yeah, that's right. I saw that this morning. I sold my mini John Cooper Works, my mini uh, Countryman John Cooper Works, and I bought a BMW 228. Just Excellent. so everybody knows, whenever you come over Grand to Nick's, Coupe. Nick's house, you never know exactly what car is what. Is it something he actually bought, or is it a press car? So I that was the first thing yeah, I'm like, I got. What do you new, mean? I got a new BMW. You actually bought something. Two twenty eight. Well, I probably will sell it again. Yeah. See, I know you too well. <laughs> It'll last a year. I'm like a horse trader. Buy a car, buy a car, sell a car, sell a car, sell a car. Uh, yeah, I bought a new Grand Coupe. I drove it like two years ago in Germany and just was in love. Yeah. And I really wanted one. Um, I, and you got it. I will. I, a zero to 16 six seconds, by the way. Nice. Try oh. catching me that. It was actually delivered while I was in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And my spouse, uh, I said to my spouse, uh, have you driven it yet? And my spouse said, yeah. Of well, course I did. I drove it to the end of the road and back just to see what it was like. <laughs> 
like, woo. <laughs> That's what you call a COVID drive. Mm -hmm. It takes the to end the of the road back. back. Like, yeah. I, don't think he, I, don't, I don't think it was even get out of the car. I think oh. it was just drive it to the road, end of the road mm. back. Mm. Well, yeah, I'm sure you're going to show me you like me the color I chose? It goes. Uh, it's kind of, I'm. Concrete. Yeah, like I know. Concrete gray. Exactly. I and really like the what Toyota the concrete West, color. What is the Northwest? Gray. Oh, I'm going to blend in, aren't I? Uh-huh. Gray clouds, gray sky. Just, uh, I don't like gray. What color are your, tr uh, your vehicles? <laughs> what? Black. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's a big difference from gray, isn't it? <laughs> well, at least you can see mine. At least mine's got mine. some white in. When, when it's raining. I put some white in mine, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> at least you can see mine in did the Did you rain. sell your truck yet? Your other truck? No. I'm getting it ready, though. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I am All getting right. it ready. I'm just saying. Hey, what's, uh, what's left on the show, Jen? Like you'd know. Uh, still to come, Tyson Hominy, Vice President of Data and Analytics at JD Parent Associates, is going to join us to talk about car sales, how they look. Uh, Ishan is going to join us from Mini to talk about two new Minis that are on offer. They're going on sale too. And Anton, don't forget Anton Woman and Winter Driving with Perry Stern. Oh, look at you. You could actually host this show. Uh -huh. Can I take next week off? No. Why? Because I said so. What are you talking about? I'm the producer. No. <laughs> Funny enough, she thinks she's my boss. How strange is that? Wake up call coming in the next break. Jen, wake up call coming in the next break. Stand by, more Our Auto Expert on the way. We're going to come back with Tyson Hominy. We're going to talk about how sales are going in North America. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert podcast. Locally created, nationally celebrated from the northwest to the southeast, this is the World's Car Radio Show. It has a throttle. We'll feature it on air, online, on smartphone, or on smart speaker. This is our auto expert, where two million Americans get their automotive news daily. I'm your host, Nick Miles, along with truck girl, Jen. The automotive industry seems to be coming out of its cocoon. If you take a look at some of the graphs, there seems to be some emergence some s from some of the darker times that we have been suffering. Joining us on the phone to talk about how the sales look, is Tyson Hominy. He is from JD Power and Associates. So let's talk a little bit about some of these graphs. If we look at them, looks like we had a very bleak few months there in the middle, some huge drops at the beginning of the pandemic, but things look like they're above the median line there and we are doing fairly well. Is that how I'm in, am I interpreting it correctly? Yeah, and Nick, thanks for having me back, and, and hi to Jen again. Hi. Um, yeah, you're seeing you're seeing it right. Uh, we're actually seeing two months in a row of retail share gains in the auto industry. We saw it in January and February. We haven't seen very much of it in the past four years. So things are looking very strong right now. October was a, a great month for the industry. Uh, November may not be as strong, but we'll you know we'll we'll get to that when when it comes. So let's talk about family vehicles and non-premium vehicles, first of all. Uh, where are we standing right now? Uh, how do things look as opposed to some of the darker months? Uh, we're above the line. We're very strong. Um, how much did we gain from what we were expecting to do before COVID? So we're, we're up uh, about 2 to 3% in the most recent months from, from pre-COVID levels. Um, but on an overall industry basis, on year to date, we're, we're down about 16 percent uh, in sales. So we're not performing as well as, as we had wanted to at the beginning of the year. But again, our, our end point, our, our run rate coming out of the year is, is particularly strong. And it's, it's trucks. You know, we, we say it a lot. It's pickup trucks. But, but it's the truth. Pickup trucks continue to sell very strongly. Is it really thrown off what you can do as far as projections are concerned? Because as things change month by month, week by week, uh, you really can't throw any projections out. The uh, of, Obviously, if you follow what COVID is doing, uh, things change again month by month, week by week. So you can't make any predictions. Are you just having just to rely on raw data and not make any forecasts? Well, we always do rely on data. I mean, that, that's what makes us different at J.D. Powers, the data that we have. But you're absolutely right, Nick. What, what's really hard to forecast are the non-retail sales, the fleet sales, the commercials, the, the Hertz rentals and the Avises. When are they going to start buying again? When will commercial customers need delivery vans and, and other, other vehicles again? That's the hard part of the industry to forecast. I mean, we're, we're a group that typically says the forecast is down to a, a single unit level of precision and we're throwing out ranges now. Uh, so we're, we're ad adjusting to the new environment. It is a little harder to be precise, 
But we do have the data that comes in from dealers every day, and that helps us to, to really put out some accurate projections. There are some interesting things as far as fleet sales are concerned because there are certain industries who really can't, uh, you know, avoid buying vehicles. You know, police departments, fire departments, those sort of services and medical departments, they can't stop buying vehicles. They still, in fact, they may be buying more vehicles. As deliveries, Amazon, those type of companies have to keep buying vehicles. In fact, delivery departments may be buying more vehicles than they did before because there's a lot more at-home deliveries. But again, rental fleets... Uh, probably completely decimated. Um, they are not doing any rentals whatsoever since vacations are all, and, and business travel is almost non-existent. Yeah, that's exactly right. When we look at the, the commercial van and the commercial truck space, what we saw is that on a year-to-date basis, the change there exactly mirrors the rest of the industry. I mean, it, it is exactly performing the way, to your point, the Amazons and the delivery services and the Uber Eats, uh, people still need to get things delivered. In fact, demand for that is, has been going up. And so we're seeing very strong sales on that side of the business. But you're right, the rental cars, the, uh, you know, the people not traveling, the lack of business travel means it, it, it isn't such a great part of the industry right now for you know, daily rental companies buying vehicles. But I'll tell you, Nick, in the past several weeks and months, we are starting to see that activity pick up, showing signs of life, as you mentioned. So let's talk about luxury vehicles because, you know, those people that have money to spend on luxury vehicles, premium vehicles, they are less affected by the pandemic because their incomes tend to be less affected. So how are sales of luxury vehicles? <laughs> luxury sales, uh, actually, they're not performing as strongly right now, believe it or not. Um, it, it kind of goes back and forth with the rest of industry. But I got two interesting points that I think you're going to like here. The two hottest segments in the industry right now, bar none. Uh, the only places, in fact, that are up, there's two segments. One is premium sports cars, Corvettes, 911, that's growing. Um, the other one that's growing, the super premium space, the Bentleys, the Rolls Royces, the McLarens. You put all those together, that space is up 10% year to date. Recession? What recession to those people? Um, it's right. crazy. The higher you go, the better the vehicles are, are selling. If I'm looking for an amazing deal, what's the worst performing segment right now where I can uh, jump in and grab myself a car at the best discount? Well, the worst performing segment is the mid-sized premium car. You know, your, your 5 Series and E-Class and, and, and others in that space. People just don't want those anymore. But I'm going to tell you, the, the segment that I still think offers the best deals right now are compact SUVs, which would be your Ford Escapes and your, your Chevy Equinoxes and your Toyota RAV4s. That segment is actually performing worse than the industry overall, and it's the biggest segment in the industry, wow. which means we've got a lot of cars we've got to move there, so we've got to keep the incentives going in that space. Uh, where are automakers throwing their money on vehicles? What are they putting the most money on, on the hood of? Um, so it, it, it's still kind of some of those things where you get back to there's a lot of money in pickup trucks. We don't have a lot of inventory, but there's still a lot of dollars on those out there. And additionally, the, the compact SUVs, there's a lot of, of incentives on, on certain vehicles. Um, so you will see various automakers still running 0% deals, 0 for 72 months APR, 0 for 84 month APRs. You'll still kind of see those out there. And that's been one of the biggest stories of the pandemic is very cheap uh, interest rates are allowing us to offer these long-term 0%, 0.9% deals to consumers, and, and consumers are loving them. Who's buying cars? What demographics? Well, at the, at the beginning of the recession, we actually saw that the, the oldest demographic, the most mature customers, the 56-plus-year-old consumers, were mostly out of market. And it made sense because they were the most susceptible to the virus. Um, when we looked recently, in fact, the last couple of months, Everybody, all three age groups, from the, the youngest consumers, the middle age, and the mature ones, they're all back to their pre-COVID participation in the market. It's been really interesting. We've, we've converged again. Um, that said, the mature customers were out for so long, and we're missing so many of them from market that I, we know there's still a lot of them on the sidelines. So as we go through the recession here, I anticipate the most mature customers to start being a much bigger part of the industry. How are people buying their vehicles? Are they still buying them at dealerships or are they, uh, have we really pushed that digital buying forward? 
That, that's another great story from the pandemic is that digital buying has advanced very rapidly. And it's one of those things that once you have it, you're never going to go back. I mean, I, I probably told this anecdote on this show before. You know, I can get a margarita still delivered to my house in Tennessee. And once you can get that delivered, you never want to go back, right? And so now you can get cars. You can do the whole process remotely. You can call up your dealer or text them and tell them what vehicle you want and what you want to pay. And you can negotiate it and they'll bring it to your house. And once you do that, you never want to go back. And so at some, at, during the, the peak of coronavirus, some markets, it's the only way we could do business. And we saw those markets were performing about 30 percent of, of what their rate should have been, which means about a third of all transactions uh, were, were done digitally. Um, and for us as an industry, that's about a three times run rate is what it was just a year ago. And so it's a big change. You know, anyone listening to the program, if you don't want to go to dealership, you don't have to. And if anyone says you do, don't listen to them. Call someone else because you can do this whole thing from your couch. So uh, let's talk about what's happening with electric cars, diesel, hybrid, BEVs, uh, PHEVs, uh, plug-ins. You know, where are we with those? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the plug-in space, the, the pure BEVs, the electric vehicles, the, the plug-in hybrids, which, which probably still is going to be the future. They're going to come here and we're going to be buying them in bigger numbers. But this year, they're actually down during coronavirus. Um, what we're seeing is traditional hybrids are performing very well. Uh, that includes the addition of the RAV4 hybrid and the CRV hybrid. So two traditional hybrids in the two biggest segments, in the biggest segments, two of the biggest sellers adding them. And that has pushed up the share of traditional hybrids, kind of at the expense of these more expensive beds. But the fuel that is doing the best this year, and it kind of blows my mind, Nick, I can't even believe I'm saying this, but diesel continues to perform very well. Um, we've added diesel engines to light-duty pickup trucks like the Silverado. We put them in vehicles like the Wrangler and the Gladiator for the first time, and consumers are buying those up. Diesel is the number one performing alternative fuel vehicle right now. I, don't, I can't believe I say those words. <laughs> awesome. And finally, uh, Tyson, where do you think we're going to be at the end of the year? Last year we were at 17 million vehicles. The end of 2020, what do you think the total number is going to be? Yeah, this year we're going to be somewhere in the mid-14 range. So it's, it's going to look a little, bit, uh, a little bit down historically, but compared to like the Great Recession, when we were down below 10 million, having a 14 million industry is still pretty good. Uh, and looking ahead to next year, we're expecting it to grow about a million units next year as well. So things, we, we, you know, we peered into the abyss, but we backed away and, and we're performing well. And we expect things to continue to, to grow from here. We may not get back to 17 million for a long time, but we're, we're not, you know, 2009 and 2010. So it, it, things are, are looking very positive, Nick. Tyson Jomini from the JD Power and Associate. He is the Vice President of Data and Analytics. It's always good to have you on the show. A good picture of what's happening as far as the auto industry is concerned and seeing where the sales are and where they are not. And, of course, also giving people a picture of where they can get some deals and where they should maybe hold off in buying a brand-new vehicle. Stand by. We still have more to come on the show. We're going to talk about the brand-new Mini Oxford, uh, the Countryman Oxford edition, and the 1499 G which is coming out with Aishan and also Anton Warman and Perry Stern joining us. That's all to come on Our Auto Expert. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Catch up with previous episodes of the show at our website, ourautoexpert.com. You can hear all past shows, see automotive videos, and read inside the car stories about your next ride. Our Auto Expert is where 2 million Americans get their automotive news daily. You'll find it all at ourautoexpert.com. Well, you know, uh, I am a massive mini fan, and every time there is mini news, I like to be able to talk about it. And so it's with great pleasure that we uh, actually invite Aishan onto the show. He is one of the guys that does a lot of the product planning and talking about minis and we got to hang out at uh, the Monticello Car Club in New York City to uh, see some of the new minis that were uh, being driven around the track the brand new Mini Countryman and the GT and the Mini Electric and so Mini uh, announced two brand new vehicles uh, about two weeks ago the uh, Mini Cooper 1499 GT and the Mini Countryman Oxford Edition um, so tell us a little bit about these two new minis. Now, the 1499 GT is a throwback to some mini heritage, isn't it? Absolutely, Nick. Good afternoon, firstly, and thank you for having me. Um, I, I feel like mini is one of the brands that, of course, out there that 
can and does speak to our heritage a lot, and it's something that we're inherently very, very proud of. So the model in reference, the 499 GT, is our way to give a nod to our sporty heritage, and it goes back to 1969. So on the 10-year anniversary for Mini, we introduced a, a model called the 1275 GT, which in its time was incredibly sporty. It featured a 1275 CD engine, and a whopping 60 horsepower delivered from it with a 30-60 time of 13.3 seconds. That's awesome. Right. The 49 yeah. <laughs> of course, uh, is slightly quicker than that. So it's, it's the Cooper engine that we know and love today. It's a three-cylinder, 1.5-meter twin-power turbo engine. has a 0-60 time significantly quicker than the 13.3 mentioned. But it was our way of simply saying that you do not need all the bells and whistles that everyone keeps throwing at cars these days to have a lot of fun. Fun to drive is, of course, the number one factor that customers keep coming back to us. It's the number one purchase factor for me here in the U.S. So we wanted to show people that you can have a lot of fun, something that's stripped down, bare bones, uh, three pedals. Of course, another thing we're inherently proud to do, offer majority of our cars and our transmission. And our answer was, of course, the 1499 GT. So how do you come up with the numbers 1499? The last one obviously was 1275. So yeah. how does the 1499 relate? Does it have, does the numbers, you know, someone drew them out of a hat or how did you come up with them? No, not at all. It's, uh, we followed the same methodology as we did back in 1969. The, the 1275cc four-cylinder engine that was there in that particular model, okay. we have the three-cylinder one, uh, 1499cc engine in okay. the Cooper today. Good. So, I- uh, just yeah. check. I was just testing you, honestly, just testing you. <laughs> Good job, Nick. Um, so, you know, price-wise, you get a car that's uh, a sort of a, a, a race car without all of the buttons and flashy lights, but still the spirit of Mini from the ground up. Uh, so price-wise, what are we sort of talking about for the special edition? Because I've seen, I've been into Mini dealerships, and New York Auto Show 2018, I saw a Park Avenue sitting at the Mini dealership, and uh, these things are worth quite a bit of money. I think uh, even then it was sort of worth the same same amount of money that you paid for it brand new, um, in, what, probably about eight years after the Park Avenue edition of the Mini hardtop came out. it was uh, They were still sort of... Uh, worth money, once you do a special edition Mini, they seem to sort of hold their value quite radically. Most definitely. And I feel like one of the things that, of course, adds to that exclusivity is the fact that we do a very limited number of these editions. So the 1499 GT, there's only 150 that are going to be making their way over here onto the oh. US doors. Um, so there's just about one for every Mini dealer out there. Some of them might be lucky enough to get two. From a price point, I think everyone's going to be pleasantly surprised the way the car today with the JCW appearance package on it, with the really sport 17-inch wheels, with, of course, the manual transmission, touchscreen navigation, Apple CarPlay, the really cool 49GT-specific side graphics, the piano black headlight tailoring. All in, we're looking at a price of 27040 so just a smidge above $27,000. That is not including the DNH, but yes. Not bad is exactly the kind of reaction that we're we're hoping for. Um, and that's pretty good for all of those sort of thrills in that one as well. Plus, knowing that the car is uh, still going to be a, somewhat of a collector's item. Uh, I do notice that many people don't uh, want to sell these quite often too. Now, going back to the uh, the what you started really was for sort of college students, the Mini Oxford. You've now stepped that up into the Countryman. Absolutely. So we introduced uh, what is, of course, the nomenclature today, the, the Oxford edition back in 2018. And initially, it was a college student-specific deal only, and it was only available on the hardtop two-door and four-door. Um, short, slowly but surely, we opened it up to more individuals. We opened it up to active military and retired military personnel. But as of last year, we ha- now have Oxford, and we like to call it Oxford for All. So as of model year 20, which is, of course, just this year itself, in uh, in June of the year, we introduced the Oxford edition for the Countryman. And it's our way of, again, getting the mini uh, buyer into the market, just getting our way onto more shopping lists and just having a true value proposition out there for a car that, of course, happens to be very important for the mini brand here in the U.S. Right, so it's, uh, it, know, it's sort of packed full of technology and equipment for a lesser price. Absolutely. 
So you get all the series standard equipment that is associated with the Countryman as it is. You have the 8.8-inch screen, you have the panoramic sunroof, you have a 7-speed clutch transmission, you have the LED headlights, which of course now are paired with really, really cool Union Jack taillights. But then over and above, you get 10-inch wheels, you get a choice of metallic paint, because we know many customers love choice when it comes to specking their cars out. You have heated seats, auto climate control. Now, normally, if you were to build a Countryman like that, you would be looking at a price of about $32,000. But for the Oxford edition specifically, that has an showroom price of $26,500. So there's about a savings of $7,500 compared to a regular Countryman if someone goes for Oxford. Now, lastly, are they available right now? Can people go out and buy these or do they have to order them? Nope, they're definitely available right now. We just introduced the Model Year 21 Oxford edition uh, for the Countryman and the hardtops. Uh, you're more than welcome to go to your local miniature and they'll happily walk you through what needs to be done to get your hands on one of I'm actually pretty excited about this too. I think also the Oxford edition is probably an amazing uh, back-to-school car. might be a little late in the year for a back-to-school car, but uh, they're definitely a good back-to-school car. And if you're a, if you're a driving enthusiast, the 1499 GT is amazing too. Ishan, thank you for joining us, talking about those two brand-new minis. Stand by. Anton Warman is next. He's going to talk about, well, what? What's going on with electric cars, autonomous cars, and the automotive business? More Our Auto Expert on the way. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert podcast. This is Our Auto Expert radio show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can start a conversation with us, ask a question, just direct messages. Our Auto Expert is where 2 million Americans get their automotive news daily. He joins us every single week to talk about autonomous cars, business, and, of course, electric vehicles. Anton Wallman is an independent analyst and investor. You can read the majority of his stuff at The Street and Seeking Alpha. Anton, there's a lot going on in the industry as every week, so let's start off with some of the topics that are at the front of mind. European sales data, BEVs versus uh, VW versus Chinese data as far as Tesla is is concerned. So, uh, how are things doing when we come to uh, BEVs? Yeah, so battery electric vehicles, these are the pure electric vehicles, no hybrids, no plug-in hybrids of any kind. We're talking about battery only, no gas tank whatsoever. Uh, Volkswagen dominates, as they have done now since about the second week of September, when they completely shot to the top of the sales charts by a very wide margin. And in in the countries that actually reported daily sales data, so we have data now all the way through the 13th of November for the first 13th day of of November, and they are outselling a Tesla Model 3 by somewhere between 100 to 1 and 300 to 1 in the countries that are of any significance in Europe that are actually reporting data. So, yes, Tesla tends to report most of their cars in the final third month of the quarter. But so far, Volkswagen is simply clobbering Tesla in a way that is just not even... When you're talking about... Once you go beyond selling more than 100 times the number of electric cars than the um, brand market share leader worldwide, uh, then uh, people ought to really pay attention to what's coming out of Europe in this regard. It's going to be an interesting question because when we come to a year-end, a full cycle of one year, when uh, VW have been selling this, you know, Tesla obviously sells so many electric vehicles that say in Europe that they're able to trade off their credits. Now, VW, when they get to the end of a year, are they going to be uh, in the positive as far as carbon credits are concerned and be able to sell some of those carbon credits at the end of a full year in Europe, perhaps? So in Europe, despite the fact that Volkswagen has now vastly outsold Tesla in this regard, they are not going to have any extra credit to sell to anybody. They'll be lucky in a best-case scenario if they can still keep themselves from paying huge fines because keep in mind that the Volkswagen Group consists of uh, all sorts of brands, including Lamborghini and mm. Bentley and so forth, that, and Porsche that are selling all sorts of other cars, uh, not just in the U.S., but worldwide, uh, that are in need of uh, support from these credits. So 
Uh, in a best case scenario, Volkswagen may break even on this by year end, but I think they'll they may actually have to pay a little fine because they're running real short on this, even in Europe, where they're already selling most of these electric cars. Fascinating. UK mandating BEVs uh, by 2030. That's different from the 2035 that they had originally mandated. Now, the big question is, is this political or is uh, is this because there's a sort of a push for uh, Boris Johnson's party to look favorable or have people look favorably on it? Nick, you nailed it. Uh, I think this is, by the way, fresh hot off the press. I mean, this just came out today, uh, this news, that Boris Johnson had promulgated his edict from the high lords over there that uh, by 2030, every single vehicle that is sold in the UK must be a BEV. And, uh, of course, it's all political. Uh, it's not like there are voters that are asking for this in any high numbers. They would rather buy whatever makes sense at the time. Maybe it'll be a BEV. Maybe it'll be a hybrid. Maybe it'll be a plug-in hybrid. Maybe it'll be a hydrogen fuel cell car. Or maybe it will be a BEV. But uh, to dictate from the top what exactly must be sold by any particular date is, of course, crazy. But this is what they've decided for now. Of course, Boris Johnson will no longer be prime minister by 2030. So whatever happens at that time, he can you know, be sitting, uh, sipping Mai Tais down in Monaco by that time and thus laugh at the whole thing. So it, on the one hand, it's very academic. On the other hand, 2030 is only 10 or nine years away now. And uh, automakers, as you know, Nick, must plan enormous shifts in production capacity and the entire structure of their supply chains to meet these types of mandates. And at this point, this causes a huge dilemma for them uh, as to whether they think that these mandates will be upheld or whether they will be changed before we get to 2030. And on a sub note from that, I noticed that the Conservative Party in the UK was pretty excited to announce that Nissan will be returning to the UK and building hybrid vehicles, or maybe even plug-in hybrids at the Sunderland plant uh, there, which Nissan had announced that they were sort of uh, backing down on production of vehicles in England but uh, post-Brexit. But it looks like that the Conservative Party have con- convinced them to come back and produce vehicles in the UK. Yeah, I think uh, that's also a little return to reality there. At the end of the day, Brexit will not mean very much in terms of Britain's position with respect to the rest of the UK. So uh, the slight shift at that, I mean, I think they, Nissan was basically trying, like most other automakers were, to try to exert some political influence and get the British government to change its mind about Brexit. And when that didn't work, essentially what the UK government did is that it called Nissan's bluff on this, and now we'll see the results. Uh, let's talk about the U.S. and cars that we will see on our streets. Mustang Marquee deliveries beginning December 7th. Yeah, I mean, this is an iconic uh, vehicle, of course. It looks great. The specs seem to be all there. And I think we should uh, now recognize that we are within the one-month mark of the first expected U.S. deliveries. European deliveries are set to begin roughly by the end of January. So uh, let's keep our uh, eyes on this very soon, Nick. It sounds like, from some of the rumors, that there may be a Lincoln version of this called the Lincoln Mark, Mark, M-A-R-K-E, coming as well. Is this going to be just a Lincoln rebadged version of the Mark E? I don't know, Nick, but I do know this. Ford, just like all the other automakers, is scrambling to plug in all of these, no pun intended about plugging in, but they're looking to add a variety of body shapes and market segments into a BEV portfolio, just like they're coming to market with the F-150 BEV, like the Ford Transit BEV, and something else. Definitely we'll see a Lincoln. We'll see multiple Lincolns over time, as well as multiple other new form factors as well. So uh, all of these things sound eminently possible, but I can't confirm it myself in terms of the specific timing quite yet. Um, so that brings up a good point. I've seen lots of sort of uh, Ford PR uh, sheets coming out this week about their uh, Ford Transit Electric. Uh, we've heard a lot about Amazon and their electric delivery van from Rivian, uh, but the Ford are pushing hard ahead with their electric transit van. Is this going to make a dent in the market? Is it going to have significant changes to the delivery system in the United States and have some good numbers? What are we thinking? I think so, because you're talking here about a, a variety of tradespeople. Not to, we think about package delivery. turns out package delivery is no more than about 10% of that market. Electricians and other tradescraft people, and they're driving very short distances. Ford said those types of customers drive no more than on average 74 miles per day. And this new 
transit van has a range of 126 miles, they say, which may seem like the margin of error there is still a little bit on the tight side. But nevertheless, there are a variety of municipal fleets and other tradespeople for whom a vehicle like that could end up uh, working. So I think that, uh, you know, this may not be the biggest market in the world quite yet, but I think it'll make a dent and I think it'll be noticeable. And I think that uh, I think it's a sensible corner of the market to at least begin to get a foothold. So a smart move by Ford, I think. Now, we all have high hopes about new vehicles being introduced, and uh, one of the vehicles that we were sort of looking for a big bang from was uh, BMW's iNext. It was introduced this week, although it didn't seem to get as much fanfare as we were expecting. Well, we've been hearing about this thing for so many years now, so people are basically saying, oh, get on with it, get it onto our shores. Manufacturing will begin right around July of 2021, and it'll take at least about six months until we see it in U.S. showrooms. The vehicle will be made, at least in the beginning, in Germany only. So uh, for a few months, be sold in Europe and then uh, be put on boats to come to the United States. And, and I think the design was quite interesting, a little bit better than I had feared. And uh, I think that uh, is what we're facing here with BMW and the uh, uh, iX, previously called the iNext, Uh, is that uh, competition will be very, very tough. This is the segment in which Jaguar, Audi, Mercedes are already playing in Europe, and uh, Tesla is, of course, playing, and then a truckload, almost literally, of all of these other vehicles that will be playing in that segment will be in the market roughly around that time. Just imagine Hyundai, Kia, and Genesis and their various sub-brand Ionic. Uh, This will be a tough, tough marketplace, and uh, uh, BMW certainly has its uh, work cut out for it. And finally, it can't all be good news. Uh, Chevy got a little bit of a ding into their thigh this week with the Bolt getting a recall. Yeah, so I think they said six units had caught on fire at some point along the way. That's among a fleet of uh, something along the lines of 70,000 vehicles worldwide that have been sold. So you're talking one in 10,000, okay? One in 10,000. And uh, kudos to GM for actually doing a proper recall. You know, you, I know other automakers who don't do recalls and their stuff <laughs> go on fire. And uh, I think GM is doing the right thing overall when you look at GM's history here with the Volt, the Spark, now the Bolt, and a variety of other vehicles like the Cadillac ELR and others that have been plug-in vehicles over the years. The GM has been selling, frankly, longer than anybody since the 90s. Uh, GM's safety record in this regard is absolutely exemplary. So uh, I say, look, my uh, when it comes to uh, reliability and safety and everything when it comes to electric vehicles, I put GM at the very, very top of the heap, combining experience yeah. with responsibility. So I'm a big fan there. Absolutely. Anton Wallman, thank you for joining us, as you do every week. Independent analyst and investor. You can read a majority of his stuff at The Street or Seeking Alpha. And he's a great guy, probably knows more about electric cars, autonomy, and, of course, investments in the auto industry than anybody else. You should follow him because if there's news to be broken, he's the man to be breaking it. You can, of course, listen to Our Auto Experts, previous shows at OurAutoExpert.com, and, of course, get the latest news at 2 million Americans do around the world. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Your smart speaker can be your radio. Just say, hey, Google, hey, Alexa, or hey, Siri, play Our Auto Expert radio show. And all previous episodes of the podcast are available. Hours of endless fun await you. I'm Nick Miles. This is Our Auto Expert radio show, where 2 million Americans get their automotive radio and news daily. <laughs> daily, Jen. I know. Isn't that daily. great? Daily. It is, absolutely. Uh, Perry Stern is uh, part of our auto expert. He's part of the team. He uh, does some fantastic, fantabulous articles online. Uh, always has a great insight into the automotive world. Also, uh, MSN Autos, he is a big, big contributor to that webpage, and he joins us on the phone to talk about winter driving tips. Uh, my big winter driving tip is stay home under a blanket. <laughs> That's, that's I agree. It. It's not yeah. a bad idea. It's not a bad idea at all. <laughs> my my other they say, my other tip, Perry, is all wheel drive helps you go, but it doesn't help you stop. Right. <laughs> that's, that's that's actually one of the biggest the biggest issues people have, especially around here. You know, it doesn't snow here very much, but when it does, all those people that uh, went out and bought their SUVs feel invincible. <laughs> And they so can true. get going really well, but uh, they don't stop any better than a car that doesn't have four-wheel drive. 
My favorite thing, we should talk maybe for a second about stupid people in the snow, but my favorite thing is to watch someone put chains. <laughs> longer than that. Yeah. My favorite thing is to watch someone put chains on the rear wheel, uh, on the rear wheels when they have a front wheel drive car. That's yeah. awesome. Uh-huh. <laughs> I have seen that many times. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't snow here all that much, but even in the, you know, when it gets cold and rainy, uh, the roads get slick. And so you kind of have to be careful. Um, let's be, let's be positive. Yeah, let, is, let's be positive and talk about things that will help, not uh, <laughs> not that we can laugh at. <laughs> right, exactly. There, but you know, there's always the YouTube videos to do the laughing. Yes, right? that's um, great. But basically, it's it's a, a lot of it is about slow and steady. You know, you wanna you wanna leave extra space between the cars in front of you. You know, as you're coming up to that stoplight, even if it's green, don't floor it because <laughs> if it turns. If it's going to change, you're going to end up sliding through the intersection and bad things happen when that happens. Yes. Um, and at the same time, when you're going to, you know, if you're going to be driving slower and steadier, leave more time. I mean, don't leave 10 minutes before your appointment when you've got 15 minute drive to get there. Um, it's, you know, just leave some more time so you can drive a little carefully and and not do stupid things. Yeah, I think the other thing I, I always try to encourage people to do is you may be a great driver in the snow. But not everybody is. Right. And leave enough space for the people who aren't as good as you are. <laughs> because, you know, if somebody pulls out in front of you or somebody has a problem, you want to leave enough space so you don't have to hit them because they do something silly. Exactly. Yeah. And like exactly. I said, weight distribution and a lot of the... is huge. People don't think oh, about absolutely. that. Um, and the other big thing is tires. You know, you can have the, you know, an Audi Quattro with the best, one of the best four wheel drive systems. And if you have summer tires on that car, it's just four ice skates. Uh, and you're just going to go sliding all over the place. And so you will actually do much better in the snow with a front wheel drive car with proper winter tires than you will with all wheel drive and summer tires. I'm very glad that automakers have started to call them three season tires instead of all season tires, mm. which is much better than, than calling them all season tires because there's no such thing as an all season tire. There's there's only a three season tire. Um, it might get you through the winter as long as you don't have frozen roads. Exactly. And, you know, all season tires, you know, four season, three season tires will get you through most of the cases. Um Obviously, traction will be down. You know, I've been to a couple events where we've tested out all-season versus winter tires. And compared to all-season tires, winter tires are like, it's like cheating. It's almost like you're driving on pavement because they stick to the snow and ice so well. And it's really worthwhile if you're going to have a lot of bad weather, a lot of snow, or even just cold roads. The winter tires can make a huge difference. Uh, Did you go to the uh, Bridgestone Blizzex? Have you ever been to one of their programs? Um, I've not been to one of them recently. Uh, I know that uh, my colleague Mike has been to uh, a couple of them because uh, he's Mr. Tires. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's tested out the cars on the ice skating rinks and things like that. And it is it is fascinating how, you know, and it's even just the compound of those tires. They actually stick. Yes. I mean, it's great to see that you can stop a third faster in some of these, uh, you know, Michelin have their winter tires and and Bridgestone have their winter tires. Most car companies make a winter tire. And it's absolutely incredible how you can stop a third faster with a correct tire on. And it's usually when you uh, when you get below freezing that the tire is good till about 30 degrees. But you get anything below that and, you know, the tire just doesn't respond as well. Well, It's amazing when you start too. A, the huge difference when you're taking off in ice versus, you know, a winter tire versus, a, like you said, an all-season tire. Yeah. It's completely different. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the other thing is, you know, you should be checking the weather. I mean, to see if what the weather's, what the conditions are going to be like. I mean, are you going to, you know, head out in the morning and everything is fine with your, you know, front-wheel drive all-season tire car, and by the time you're leaving your appointment, there's three or four inches of snow on the ground. It's good to know that ahead of time. <laughs> No, absolutely. Um, do you do you recommend people carry an emergency kit in their car? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I grew up in the Midwest where you know there were bad snowstorms, and I kept you know an emergency blanket in my car. I kept uh, the funny thing is, and this is from my mother. I had a candle because apparently, even a candle, if it's freezing cold outside and you're stuck in your car, 
it will actually provide enough heat to, you know, keep your hands warm, whatever. Um, one tip on that, though, if you keep a candle in your glove box, take it out in the summer. Otherwise, it becomes the shape <laughs> of the glove box. <laughs> that would be my life. How did you find <laughs> how I know this. <laughs> yes, yes. How did you find this out, Perry? <laughs> it's just a guess. <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to guess you had no lint in your glove box one summer. That's a way to clean it. No, but I, I had a very interestingly shaped candle, though. <laughs> and probably a very interestingly uh, shaped manual, too. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, you, couldn't exactly. Open, you couldn't open the pages of your driver's manual, could you? <laughs> no, no. But no one ever looks at those anyway, do they? <laughs> of course we do. As automotive journalists, we open every page every time we get a press car. It's like, how do I do <laughs> this? How of do course. I do that? <laughs> yeah. when, when do you What's open? What's really sad is when you get the, when you get the uh, car that you actually need to look in the owner's manual to figure out how to change the radio station. Because yes. I've had to do that. <laughs> when, when do you open the driver's? Or when do, do you open the owner's manual apart from having to change? Your, what, what's the time that you do, Perry? That I do or that yeah. people should? No, that you do. I mean, when do you, when do you actually, because I know mostly things about cars, but when do you open the, the manual? What's the sort When of, I can't figure something out. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's usually lights on the dash. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> what is that? Is usually that when, I, when I get a warning uh, light, I'm like, what does that mean? Like, <laughs> I have to open the manual. And, I, and in cars that I own, I've actually used the owner's manual to figure out, you know, how do you change a headlight? And how do you do this? It's always interesting, though, when you looked up how to change a headlight and it says, we suggest taking to the dealership to do that. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Perry Stern, it's always great to have you on the show. Of course, Perry is a contributor to Our Auto Expert. He's one of the team that makes the website so amazing. You can go read his articles along with Mike Meredith and the rest of the team at OurAutoExpert.com. You can see the videos and, of course, listen to this radio show. They're all stored at OurAutoExpert.com. Just hit the little tab that says Podcast so you can enjoy those all week long, see the videos, and, of course, 24-7 entertainment. It's right there. We'll see you next time on Our Auto expert you've been listening to our auto expert with nick mile find all the show episodes at our please follow us on all social media twitter facebook and instagram at our auto expert and message us for a quick and witty response 